Before we start, I just want to do a tiny experiment with you guys in the audience. Who here has heard of um, Tinder? Come on, don't be shy. No judgment. All right, good. Uh, who here has heard of Interactive Corp? OK, slightly fewer. Well, that's good, because Joey and I are going to be talking about Interactive Corp for the next 20 minutes. So hopefully, we'll give you a good explanation. Now, if I get this right, did it come up? There it is. No, that's the, that's the wrong one. Hold on. There you go. No, that's the right one. That's Interactive Corp. So when I look at that slide, Joey, I think conglomerate, because it looks a lot like a conglomerate. Tell us why it's not a conglomerate. Yeah, most conglomerates only aggregate assets uh, and try and have more and more different um, segments. I see over its history, actually, we call it the anti-conglomerate because we, we, we build businesses, we acquire businesses, we grow businesses, but we also have spun off, if you go back through ISC's history since the beginning, we've spun off 10 different companies, or what, what started as one ISC has, has turned into 10 different companies, and uh, in the last let's say 10 years or so, I think we've spun off uh, six companies. Uh, and we, our, our philosophy is we want to build these businesses, we want to grow these businesses, we want to make them great businesses, and we want to make them uh, independent businesses when it makes sense. Uh, and that is, I think, different in the sense that, that we're not in the empire building, we're in the, the shareholder value creation business. Okay, all of that is fair, but the market still treats you like a conglomerate. You still trade at a discount to the sum of the parts. Does that bother you? I, it, it, sure, I think it's frustrating. I, maybe it's in some senses amusing, and it's an opportunity for us. I, I view it that way. I think long term, that's something that we'll overcome. I tell our shareholders and our employees and everybody all the time that the only thing that matters in growing this business, the only thing that matters in, in delivering value for shareholders over time is execution in the businesses. On top of that, we maintain the option to do things that can capture those discounts, uh, whether it's share repurchases, whether it's share issuances, whether it's debt or dividends or things like that, that, that or, or spin-offs or split-offs or, or things like that allow us some tools to work with to, to uh, address those discounts uh, when we want to. But the only thing that ultimately matters is execution and consistent execution and telling that story consistently. And that's really what we focus on right now, and I believe the discount addresses itself over time. I believe it's possible to convert that discount to a premium. But there are some fundamental things in as it relates to multi-business businesses that, that lead to discounts that that may never be addressable. So part of what I see, I see the structure you can see from the chart, two of our companies there, Match Group and Angie Home Services, are public companies. So I see as the parent is a public company, the Match is a public company, we own 81%. Angie is a public company, we own 87%, 85%. That uh, combination is, it, it, it allows people to invest in Match directly, it allows people to invest in Angie directly, and then what some shareholders say is, well, if I'm gonna invest in everything, and I gotta understand this, and I gotta understand that, and I gotta understand all these other things that aren't even public, I want a discount for that. But you're getting the other stuff for free. That you do get it, you get it all for free. I think it's a pretty good deal. Now, you're also about to start breaking out the results of uh, Vimeo and Dot Dash. Separately, is that a clear indication that one or both are going to be spun out as well? No, but it w I would love for them to be in a position to, to do it. I, I, I suppose it's a step in the right di direction, but that doesn't mean it's on some fixed timeline. It doesn't mean it'll ever happen. Uh, but I do think it's a testament to Vimeo has reached a level of scale where you think it's worth breaking it out on its own, and Dot Dash has reached a level of scale. Same story. So a big part of what you do when you talk about execution is obviously incubation, successfully growing these companies sort of under the IAC umbrella. But another big part of it is leadership and picking the right leaders for, yep. these, for these businesses, either while they're still under the IAC thing or once they go public and you have the controlling stake. A lot of the time in tech, we see a real disconnect between the people who are sort of the visionaries who found these companies and the people who are good to actually take them on as leaders. You know, uh, there are a lot of obvious examples, Uber perhaps the most, sort of the largest recent one. Um, one of our famous alumni. Uh, uh, there you go, right. So, so I guess the question is, how do you go through that process? Like, how do you identify the right leaders for these businesses? And what are the qualities you look for? Sure, look, talent is a huge uh, factor for IC and a big focus. And sometimes it is the founder, sometimes it isn't. There's certainly not a formula on that. Sometimes the right private company leader is also the right public company leader, and sometimes a, a change is necessary. Uh, what we look for consistently is ambition, really. 
uh, you know, trust, candor, transparency, those are all things that are really important to us. But we are, when, when we're looking for leaders of these businesses, we want somebody with the biggest vision. Uh, if you've got a smaller vision, then the best you can do is succeed in that smaller vision. Uh, so we look for people with big vision, big ambition, big passion, and those are the people we give opportunities to. And the fun thing about that is we give those people opportunities kind of independent of their experience and independent of their age and independent of their background or education or any of those things. And we've got great examples of that. I mean, you mentioned Uber, which is the current CEO is Dara Koshashahi. X XIC guy. XIC, uh, he was the CFO of IC, he was the CFO of IC, and IC was a big company then too. We, had, we spun some stuff off, but he was, I think he was CFO of IC at 30, 31, somewhere between 29 and 32 years old, then went on to be CEO of Expedia at, at a young age, which became a big company, and, and, and of course now he's at Uber. I think I, I was a beneficiary of that program, Barry Diller, who, who, really, who started IAC. He uh, got big opportunities from people at a young age. And those are the kinds of things, you can find ambition, talent, passion, excitement in people. And those things, you can, I think you can ride a lot better um, necessarily than experience. You can supplement those things with experience and other people or people around them. But you, you, you look for that ambition. And our view is we give people a chance. Many times it doesn't work out. That's OK, too. We give them enough. We give them a chance. We give them enough space. And if it works, they run with it and they take more. And if it doesn't, you know, that's OK, too. I'm going to pull up the chart that is a nicer one. Here you go. So this is IC versus the S&P total shareholder returns, five years. You came in in June 2015, so somewhere along that line. But as you can see, IC has done very well on a, on a fairly long-term basis there. Um, but moving on from the company, let's talk about data for a moment. Uh, we're at this, I suppose, interesting inflection point where there seems to be a, a real discussion around the value exchange that's happening between consumers and their data. Uh, and really what companies need to be doing in terms of responsibility and transparency as it relates to that. Is it too late to be having that discussion? It's, well, look, it's, it's, it's never too late. I do wish we had been having that discussion. I think everybody wishes we had been having that discussion a long time ago. And I think there were a lot of people who were trying to push that discussion a long time ago. Uh, but it took, as a lot of things do, some, some severe actions to force uh, everybody internally and externally to pay attention to those things. And I think it's very good and very important that people are paying attention to those things. The, the, th when we think about data, what we think is the most important thing is that the, the price to value exchange is uh, both one that, that has a user's consent, but also passes the smell test. Consent can be a, a w tricky thing in that Because consent understand. is fuzzy, because uh, we yes. as consumers, even, even people who are relatively tech savvy, they don't necessarily understand what they're giving up the whole time. C correct. And, and it's very hard to explain to somebody in a small set of words what, what they're giving up. So number one, you, you need people, you need to give control to consumers. But number two, it, it needs to pass the smell test. And it, it's pretty obvious, you know, for example, Cambridge Analytica, that <coughs> didn't. It was a, some personality test thing that had no real value to the consumer. In exchange for that, their data went a lot of places they, that that consumer wouldn't have imagined. And when everyone realized that, they said, hold on, you know, that's a big problem. I think a company can know that. Now, I'm not saying that happened intentionally. I think a lot of those things were accidents. But you, you need, the, the, the operators of businesses have to be doing that price to value exchange on a valid basis. They have to be able to look themselves in the mirror. They have to be able to look their colleagues or their shareholders or, or their, their family in the mirror and say, we charged a fair price for this thing and that price was a user's data and that that's okay but it, it, people have to understand it and it and it has to be fair when it is i think that's okay and when it's not that's a really big problem i mean we generally favor subscription businesses 70 which is a much more clear value that's crystal clear you pay 20 bucks a month you get access to this all right Boom. so let, let's using your smell test analogy let's say i see is at the sort of you know better roses end let's say cambridge analytica is <laughs> i don't know rotting fish where do facebook sit on the on the spectrum I think they're they're figuring that out, and I don't I, I don't think they were they were doing it with bad intentions. Meaning, I don't think they said, "Let's see, uh, you know, how much we can extract." But from intentions from aside, there is a responsibility that should come with yes, that. Yes, and level I think of, that, that people didn't that, that just a lot of people were surprised by what the power of that, including people internally, were surprised by the power of the, that platform, and the extent to which misdeeds would would or could be done, and that was a wake-up call for a lot of people. Uh, so 
it's it, it, it's perhaps possible that Facebook didn't even fully understand the price that they were charging. You know, you could say this data is okay, this data value, this value exchange is okay, but when that data can be used in this other weaponized way, then it's then it became you 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 gave up much more in ways that they didn't under, understand they were giving up. What do you make of the gyrations going on over there at the moment? I, I don't. I mean, you do a lot of business them. with them, right? Yeah, we we're advertisers on Facebook. We've been partners with Facebook in in things. I don't uh, I don't envy what they're going through. I think it's hard. I mean, everybody's coming after them right now, and it's a it's a tough spot to be in. I think they'll they'll come through. I think they've been incredibly smart. They've been incredibly innovative. That's a company that executes unbelievably well and quickly. Uh, but this is going to slow them down for for sure. And uh, I I think they'll power through that. But probably an unpleasant time right now because everyone loves a pile on and everyone's piling on. Let's talk about another big um, relationship that IC has, Google. Um, Google, I know you're not going to want to be drawn on the monopoly question, but let me ask it a different way. Is it possible for any internet business to exist this, these days without advertising on Google? No. Uh, not a good one, I don't think. I, look, if you're not advertising on Google, it depends on, on th there are some businesses perhaps where it doesn't make sense, but if you're not advertising on Google, your competitors are, and you're just leaving space open for, for your competitors. So. It, it is, some businesses don't advertise at all, I can understand that, but generally, advertising, if you're an advertising business, you should be advertising on Google. If they have the greatest intent of, of uh, audience of anybody, and uh, and that's a great platform to advertise, and people should be advertising. But isn't that too much power concentrated under one roof? Uh, it is a lot of power concentrated. Too much? I, <laughs> it's, I'll leave it to, to others to judge that, but it is a, Google is a kingmaker today. If they decide that this is the authority on diabetes, that's the authority on diabetes, and uh, I don't. I don't think they'll. They're, they're doing that with ill intentions, meaning trying to mislead the making this up the diabetes community or whatever. But that is that that becomes the authority on that, and having now multiply that by every category in the world, uh, globally, and. Uh, that's a lot of responsibility in one algorithm to make those decisions on behalf of an audience that big. Okay. Let's talk about M&A uh, for a moment. Uh, you said on a recent conference call that I listened to that it was time to be returning money to shareholders. What does that tell us about the current state of the M&A market and where things are priced? Uh, look, we felt for a while and and even more so uh, in the last couple of years that, that things are expensive, things are generally um, priced to perfection in the private market. Uh, and and there's lots of capital chasing few things, and that is, that's made us reasonably conservative on M&A. The areas where we've deployed capital, where we have a fundamental advantage, is in areas where we already have assets, and so we can be, what we say, the smartest people in the room, not because of IQ or whatever, we say we're the smartest people in the room because we know dating businesses better than anybody. We know uh, home services businesses better than anybody. And so we can acquire those things smartly. In new categories, I think it's very hard because things are very expensive and everything is priced to take over the world and not everything can take over the world. Plus there's an extremely large amount of capital coming into the market in the form of like alternative Sure, money there's, families, there's, there's the soft bank money and things like that. Soft there's there's the hedge funds, hedge funds used to trade in public stuff, now all these hedge funds. It was funds the Saudi trading. money, but that maybe has evaporated. That, that in the last, I yeah. think has become less attractive. Uh, but there's also um, uh, the institutional investors who used to only invest in the public markets because things waited longer to go <laughs> public. Those are all investing in the private markets too. So, so businesses can have access to things in the private market that they didn't previously, which is maintain control, get a lot of liquidity, still maintain almost all of the upside, and that makes sense to, to hold on to those businesses longer when there's so much capital with those kinds of terms associated with it. So this brings me nicely onto the dating business. I'm going to bring up my Tinder chart. There we go. Um, in terms of M&A that you could do there, there's one very obvious target in the form of Bumble. Obviously, right now you guys are in some legal tussle with them. Uh, would they make sense as an acquisition for IC? Look, we look at everything in the dating category. We always have and we always will. Uh, I. Sure. Could it make sense at some point? Yeah. Uh, anything good. I think we're very comfortable uh, uh, competing. Uh, it's a very big market. There's plenty of competition in that market. And uh, uh, 
we'll continue to look at all of them, but um, I like the way we're, we're operating right now. We just bought a business in uh, New York, actually, called Hinge that's growing phenomenally well, that's really focused on, um, with, uh, it's everywhere, but it's really focused on coastal cities and doing very well in those markets. In regards to Tinder, and I pulled up this chart for a reason because it shows, <coughs> at least according to Bloomberg users, I'm not sure if that's a good cross-section anyway, but uh, that Tinder is, is, is more casual, or at least is used as a more casual app for dating than a lot of people, uh, th sorry, than a lot of other apps. But we are at this moment uh, in time where the, the sort of the, there's an urgent discussion really around um, relationships between men and women and between all kinds of different people. Um, and I suppose to some extent that affects the dating industry and the online dating industry as part of that. Uh, what, does, what does Tinder and therefore what do IAC do to sort of stay in front of that? Okay, I think we have a lot of opportunity as a platform. You know, we've so far been talking about platforms as forces for not good. Uh, but also all those platforms have been tremendous forces for good and I think Tinder in this area and, and other IC properties can be forces for good. So just think about the, the, the platform we have, the number of users who are coming into Tinder, the number of users who are interacting with each other in a uh, dating or relationship capacity through our platforms. We can help educate people and we can help educate people with data, in fact, with their data. So if somebody s thinks it's a good idea to send a picture of their junk to somebody else, which surprisingly some people Plenty quite of people, a lot still, of people quite apparently. a lot of people think that's a very good idea. We can say, hey, not only is this like gross, we can say, doesn't work. Statistically, we can tell you that. No one's interested. There's a lot of downsides. <laughs> no one's interested. I, we, we can guarantee you that. And yeah. it's not going to improve your odds and, and all that. So we recommend you keep that to yourself and you, you uh, uh, try a new tactic. Uh, and and you, know, you can use that in, in all kinds of capacities. You know, a huge portion of people, majority of people, they start a conversation with, hey, by the way, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that's fine, but we can also say, here's some other ways where you could be a gentleman, or here's some other ways where you can uh, say a nice thing, and, and you can help steer the conversations in ways that we think can be, be productive, and we can also improve the feedback loop, so it's not just the platform with its data, but giving users the tools to say, hey, it, and this is easier. You know, somebody could say something obnoxious to, to somebody else in a bar. So you could throw a drink in a face. That's not a lot of people have the, the gumption to throw a drink in somebody's face, even if they're a real big jerk. It actually is easier online to do that and go, hey, hit the jerk button. Although you, one would hope that, that, that to use your, your, your junk pick analogy, you'd be thrown out the bar before you could actually confront someone with that. <laughs> yeah, that but, but look, I, I like this sort of yeah. chivalry rather than dick pics. It's, yeah. a, good, it's a good model. Yeah. Um, now look, uh, uh, IAC, obviously you're a, you're a disruptor, so therefore you necessarily believe in disruption. Uh, all consumer-facing apps to some extent, and let's just continue with Tinder as, as the example here, um, are subject to fast-moving trends because consumers are fickle, we know that. Yep. Um, and no one, if you look at Tinder, uh, you know, in 10 years or 15 years from now, no one is going to want to use the app that their parents met on. They're going to want to use whatever the next thing is. So how do you, uh, uh, how do you offset that? How do you try and stay ahead of the next disruption in, in all the industries? Here? Well, look, this gets back to it's a similar strategy in M&A, but this works for, for building brands too. Um, we, we have a lot of data in this category. We have tried a lot of things in this category, and the same is true for other categories where we're doing well. We... We, we, we try and get ahead of those trends and we can and do launch new brands. Um, and you take the learnings from all the prior brands and you apply that to the new brand. I think we have 28 brands right now, maybe just in dating. And uh, some of those brands apply to particular demographics. There's one called Our Time, which is for over 50. Uh, some of those brands uh, uh, appeal to particular geographies. We have a brand called Pears, which is a phenomenal brand in Japan. Uh, Tinder has been amazing globally, but, but different brands work in, in different areas. And I, I, I do think that there is some merit to the notion that diff particular demographics or particular geos or particular eras might have particular brands. And I think we're in a very good position to do that. We have been historically, and I expect we will continue to, to be able to do that and, and want to do that. Okay, let's end on this. Uh, the, the name of this event is you know, year ahead. Uh, you, I read somewhere, uh, your advice to job seekers is always think about where the industry you're going into will be in five years from now, because really where it is now is not relevant. Where will ISC be in five years? Um, 
That, that is a, a good question. We've just uh, spent a lot of time talking about that. It, we had all the top IAC people in, um, in a meeting uh, two weeks ago where we were going through our five-year plans. And we went through all the five-year plans of all the individual businesses, and everybody has a really exciting plan and a bright future. And then after the whole meeting was over, I sat down with a few investors who happened to be in town, and they said, oh, so what, was, what did it all add up to? when you added up the IAC five-year plan. And I said, the truth is, I never added it up. And the reason is because I look at what, what we do, and of course, the, the aggregate matters, but I look at what we do and I say, Match is a business. The dating businesses in aggregate are a business. Angie Home Services is a business. And each of these things operate on their own trajectory and on their own timeline and independent of each other. We don't believe in synergies at IAC. And uh, uh, so each of those do have a story. IAC's story in aggregate is going to be building great businesses. And and I think the, the businesses we're in can and, and may be a part of that. Um, but there will certainly be new businesses. There better be new businesses than that in five years. And there's a few seeds we've planted or are in the process of planting that I think five years from now we will be talking about in the scale of Match, which is a $15 billion company, or Angie, which is a $10 billion company right now. Joey, thank you so much for the time. Thanks for having me. Yeah.